So, what is a computer? Back before like the 1920s and the 1930s, if you had looked in a dictionary for the term computer, it would have said a person who performs calculations. And that seems absurd to us now, but there really were people who were paid money to sit there and work out calculations on pencil and paper. And often what they did is they wrote their calculations out and uh, then they would put, you know, an entry in a table in a book or to be printed in a book. And they'd perform the calculation again, varying the data by a little bit, and they'd put it into a, that same book. So, for example, the real easy, uh, you know, to understand one would be is if you did not have a calculator with a sign button where you could type in 90 degrees sign and get whatever the answer is or 88 degrees sign or 72.5 degrees sign and get the answer that way, you would not want to have to calculate mathematically what that was each and every time you needed to use it. And I know that you can calculate it, you know, in terms of radians and pi and stuff like that. I can't do it. But uh, if you had a book with a sign table in it, you know, out to four or five decimal places, then, uh, then you could do the engineering that was required for that. Similarly, logarithms. Logarithms are useful when you're multiplying or dividing extraordinarily large numbers. If you want to divide A by B and they both are huge numbers, then you get the logarithm of A, you get the logarithm of B, you take the difference, it's just a pure subtraction then once you know those logarithms. It's not difficult like long division is. And then that answer gives you a logarithm which you turn back into a number. That's what slide rules were for, you know, so. The, the uh, stereotypical, you know, engineer nerd had a slide rule in his pocket at all times, you know, until everybody had pocket calculators that could do all this kind of stuff. So, by the 1800s, the needs to manipulate numbers had really outstripped the ability to manipulate numbers. People were still using abacuses back in the 1800s, believe it or not. You know, those things with the, the little pebbles on the, on the wires and you switch them back and forth in order to do math on it. People were still doing, you know, complicated math on those things. But there were some people who realized that you could mechanize, automate the processing of math via machines. And I'll give you a, a real simple example. And I hope this works out better than the last time I gave the example because I got lost. But say you have an equation that looks like this. x squared plus 2x plus 1. And you wanted to calculate this equation for all the values of x from 1 to, you know, 10,000. Something like that. So you could plug it in and put it in a, in a book that would be post, you know, in a scientific university library or whatever. So that the astronomers or the, you know, business, uh, you know, people or whatever who needed in order to be able to calculate that equation, would not have to do it over and over and over. Now that's really a pretty simple equation, but uh, you know equations can get much more complex. So we're just going to calculate a little table. We're going to say that this equals y, and we're going to try to do it. So for value of one, one squared is one, plus two, plus one, one plus two plus one is four. So what is two squared? Wake up, y'all. 4 plus, what's 2 times 2? Another 4 plus 8 is 9. We're only going to do like 3 or 4 of these. What's 3 squared? Nine. We all know what squared means. It means times itself, so that's 9 plus 6 plus 1 is 16, I believe. And then lastly, 4 squared is 16 plus 8. That's 24 plus 1 is 25. I hope that's right. So, you know. There is a pattern to the way that these numbers are growing. And if you get the pattern, you can figure out what the next value is, the value for 5, without doing that math. And let's see if we can figure out the pattern. The difference between 4 and 9 is 5. The difference between 9 and 16 is 7. The difference between 16 and 25 is 9. Now we're really seeing a pattern. The difference between those two is 2. The difference between those two is 2. So if we wanted to figure it out for 5, we would just assume that this next number here is going to be 2 more than 9, so that's 11. And then we can assume that this number here is going to be 11 more than 25, which would be 36. We could double check that. 5 squared is 25, plus 10 is 35, plus 1 is 36. So by doing this simple math, just pure addition, you know, if this was set up, then uh, 
you can generate that table much more reliably than if you just sit there and try to do it, you know, pencil and paper like that. So the people who figured out that you could do, you know, equations this way by adding rather than uh, doing that, you know, we're one step ahead of the game. But the problem was is that you hired some, you know, poor uh, Oxford graduate or whatever to create this book for you. He's going to be bored and he's going to make lots of mistakes and those book the mistakes wind up, you know, being in books. And then those books are copied to other books, and they propagate, you know, all throughout, you know, the 1800s. Of the the books of tables were riddled with errors. If you could generate them reliably by machine, you know, repeat them over and over and over, so that the same process was done to perform the calculation, then it would simplify people's lives. It would give better data to put in the tables, and then the engineers and mathematicians and statisticians and businessmen who depended upon numbers for a living could do a better job. So you notice that we, we, we were calculating the differences between the numbers. A guy named Charles Babbage invented a machine for doing this. Now the first few versions of the machine were a lot smaller and more simple than this. What they were is essentially you would just set some wheels to, uh, you know, to do that equation and then you would turn a crank and you would see what the wheels are at the end, you know, showing the, the result. And then, you know, you could turn the crank again and it would show the next iteration of it. And you could turn the crank again and it would show the next iteration of it. So the, those were like desktop models, desk calculators, you know, like people used in the 60s and 70s. Um, then, you know, he had the idea that, wow, you can make a programmable device to where you weren't just setting some wheels and you were doing it all yourself. It could be steam powered. It could read input from cards. It could print output on cards. You could write the equations, you know, in the form of cards. And then they, those cards would set the wheels. And then, you know, once the wheel started turning, it could run, it could perform that calculation with different amounts of data over and over and over. So it was the first programmable computer. Now, unfortunately for Mr. Babbage, he never got to complete it because the requirements for machining this stuff were a bit beyond the technological levels of the 19 of the 1840s or 50s or whenever he was. It weren't completely beyond, but it was difficult enough that he kept needing more and more and more money in order to do it. And his business partner finally, you know, threw it in and took all the you know machining equipment with them. And so his backers all you know all withdrew their money from the project and so you know. But it wasn't really considered a failure because he published you know all of this stuff, all the knowledge of how to do this. Other people were able to carry on and come up with other mechanical calculators, not quite as ambitious as this. But his designs actually worked, you know. Um, in the 20th and 21st century, people have built their own versions of it. And one of them sits in, a, in some IBM museum, another one sits in London or whatever, where Charles Babbage lived. So, you know, they, and they actually work. So what they have, well, let's uh, do one more thing. Where did he get the idea of programming this monstrosity by cards? There was something known as the Jacquard loom, which was a loom for weaving complicated patterns into material. And if we can get a good look at this picture, we'll see that the patterns were specified using what are effectively punch cards. Probably nobody in here has actually seen programming punch cards. I mean, people haven't really used punch cards for programming computers in the 70s or the 80s. But you know, in the mid-century 1800s, people were using punch cards in order to control the operation of machinery, specifically in this case looms, so that they could weave complicated pack of patterns for textiles to make you know pretty blankets and shirts and stuff like that. And if you can control looms like that, you can control the positions of wheels in your mechanical computing device. So the components of his computer, his computing device called the analytical engine, the first one was the difference engine, and then the more complex, totally programmable monster that we see here is called the analytical engine, is that there are different parts of it. There is a data section. His data section consisted of the geared wheels, you know. Ours, you know, data is, uh, you know, little transistors or whatever, you know, microscopic, you know gigabytes of, of RAM on, on little RAM cards. And then there was something called a store. 
the store is where the programs are stored. You know, so nowadays we store our programs in RAM or you know, maybe burned in the silicon as ROM or whatever. So you had your data, you had your store, and then you had your input. An input queue where you could put you know, a card full of data into it and it would read it out. And then you had an output queue, which you know, would be a series of cards that were dropped into the machine and you know, it would punch the answers out and, and spit the cards out. That looks astonishingly like you know, computer processing all the way up you know, until to the 70s or whatever until things got a little bit more complicated with you know, graphical terminals and stuff like that. Uh, people were using punch cards, like I said, up into the 70s. In the 80s. So that's the idea behind a, a computer is that it is a programmable device where you store the program in memory and it acts upon other memory, other data that is stored in memory to perform calculations so that you can enter data into it, it'll do some processing on it, it'll produce some output, and then it'll loop. Maybe the input has changed, it does some processing, it outputs, and then it loops. You know, looping is kind of the power of computing. If you could just you know, run something once and then it stopped and it ended, that'd be pretty, pretty much of a useless machine. Like if you were going to print a payroll check and you, you know, run the program and all it did is print one check. Great. And then you ran it again and you had to type in new data and it printed a new check. Done. You may as well just be sitting there with a typewriter if it's going to do that. You know, the, what the, where the advantage comes in is that it starts at the top of the database, it reads all the records, it prints checks out for everybody, all your employees, and then it's done. So you want it to be able to loop until finished. So typically, the programming philosophy that we will follow is the idea that our program gathers input, it does something to the input, it produces some output or it writes it to storage, it does some communication with the user, and then it loops again. Maybe it asks for more input, or maybe it hits a file to read some more data in, or a database, or whatever, and then it repeats the process. And it repeats this over and over and over. And that may look really simplified, but even you know, a really complex multiplayer game on the internet, you know, um, you're playing World of Warcraft or whatever, the same idea. What kind of input are you getting? You're you know, using your keys and your mouse or whatever your control devices are. And then what is the process? The process is using that input that you give it along with the input that uh, you know, the other people are giving on their computers to update you know, data somewhere out there you know, on, uh, I could, gee, I forgot who publishes uh, World of Warcraft. Blizzard? Yeah, Blizzard, you know, up on Blizzard servers. And the data that they are processing, you know, is I have this character and he has these attributes, you know, and this health and he can cast these spells. And this is his position on the map. And the process will update his position on the map. And if you decide to fire your bow or cast your spell or whatever, and then it loops again. You get more input. You know, I'm still running. You know, oops, the arrow's almost got me. You know, and then it loops a, a third time. You know, and this is happening like, you know, hundreds of times a second in order, in order to get a good frame rate to display on your screen. You know, nope, you weren't able to dodge the arrow. So, you know, you took this many hit points of damage and your character is wounded. You know, and it keeps looping over and over and over, updating the state of your character. Yeah, we're not going to learn what a floppy drive is or a CD-ROM. It's hard to even buy a computer nowadays with disk drives and a laptop, certainly. Okay. I'm just looking for a couple of pictures that I know are in here. When did programming, when did the development of computers really take off and why? World War II. Yay war. You know, extreme dire war always uh, spurs technological development. And uh, why is that? Well, the weapons were getting to the point where they were not merely point and shoot. You know. Instead you had to calculate artillery traje trajectories or you know if you were flying at 10,000 feet over you know a bomb site you had to know how many degrees ahead to lead you know in order to get the bomb to hit the target because you, know, you know if you're way up there if your plane is so small 
that it's hardly even visible on the ground. Imagine how difficult it is to get that bomb to fall where you want it to go. You know, and the more information you have, like the number of degrees you need to lead it, you know, in very precise measurements based on your height and your, your rate of travel, and maybe, you know, wind speed or something like that, then the better off you are at hitting the targets. You know, same with artillery, um, or, you know, ship guns. You're trying to hit a ship that's, you know, th three quarters of a mile that way, you know, with a shell that weighs this much, and how much propellant and at what angle do you need to send it to, you know. All of that is no longer just pointing a gun at somebody and shooting it. It requires math in order to do that. And so the devices, if they can be made, you know, programmable in order to do those calculations for you, that's totally great. But back then, you weren't necessarily able to do that. You know, um, the devices weren't smart enough yet. You know, the gun wasn't computerized in order to do that. So you had to have the tables. You know, I'm going to fire something this far, you know, this far away with this type of shell, with this uh, you know, <coughs> type of propellant. I better set the settings of the gun to this and do this, you know. So you would need tables. You would need books in order to do this. Same kind of things that the uh, guys needed in the 1800s in order to do their science. So you needed programmable devices in order to generate, you know, this very precise data that you could either publish in the books or build into the device in order to accomplish your goals. And the other need for computers, well, you know, if you have extremely sophisticated code makers like the Germans did, then you need extremely even more sophisticated code breaking devices, which the English, the British excelled at. And there was a guy named uh, John Newman, and I believe there's even a movie out about him now. Um, he's kind of considered one of the fathers of modern programming. You know, led the uh, creation of the devices that were used to break the German codes during uh, World War II. So there were kind of two parallel developments of, electrical, of electronic computers during World War II. The Americans were building, you know, the uh, ones that would perform the vast numbers of mathematical calculations pretty quickly, and the uh, English were interested in breaking the code, so they had performed slightly different calculations. And then, of course, they did share their data, especially after the war. But uh, so in the 40s, I don't have the picture here. Here's what a computer would look like. Your microwave oven probably has more processing power than, uh, you know, than the computers that were made in the 40s. Look how that thing was programmed. If you wanted to write a program for a computer back then, you used patch cables. You hooked up various ports together, various holes together, just like, you know, old-time switchboard operators in the movies did, in order to write a program. So, you know, you wanted it to do something, you'd hook the cables up like this. You wanted it to do something else, you'd hook the cables up in a different way. That'd be a really tedious way of programming. How was data stored? Well, there's lots of different ways, you know, of uh, creating, you know, what we call memory now. One way is through vacuum tubes, you know, which are essentially just light bulbs, but that they don't actually emit glowing light because you don't need to waste the amount of energy that would produce a visible light in order to determine if it was on or off. And so this device here, here, could add two 10-digit numbers 40 times a second. So it had the operating speed of 40 times, you know, 40 operations per second. Nowadays, the chips in our computers, you know, if you buy a laptop or a desktop computer, it's going to run at a minimum of 2 gigahertz, which is 2 billion times a second. So compare 40 times a second for a computer operation back then to 2 or 3 billion operations per second. It's just incredible how much more powerful our devices are than they were then, or even, you know, just 20 or 30 years ago. So, you know, that's one kind of monstrosity, but getting closer to our own era, you know, in the 1970s, before the Apple IIs and Commodores and, and stuff like that, you could order an Altair out of the back of Popular Mechanics or something like that. And this is an expansion. You didn't get this if you ordered the base unit. All you got was this and some cards, and you could then order some more cards and you could build yourself your own computer. Man, I built my own computer. Okay, now I'm ready to do something with it. Well, you have to enter some software. You have to enter a program. Well, I don't have a keyboard. Okay, you just set your switches, and then you press another switch that was like an inner key. 
Now I've entered one, one letter of my program. Set the switches a different way. Press the enter key. I've entered two letters of my program. Set the switches a third way. Hit the enter key. I've entered three letters of my program. Run it. I don't have a screen to look at. I have blinky lights. Maybe I may, you know, perform some calculation and I could look at the blinky lights and find out what calculation was done. You know, and that was kind of a big deal. Wow, I built my own computer, but, you know, tch, yay, I built a box of switches and blinky lights. So, of course, people came up with add-on cards for it, you know, something that would display, you know, on a TV or, you know, try to say to, you know, a disk, an incredibly primitive disk drive of the time. And, you know, from the 70s, came the homebrew computer clubs and the people inventing the Apples and the Commodores and the Ataris and stuff like that. That is about enough of that lecture, except just for fun, we're going to look at a couple more things. If I can find it. Maybe it's in the other slide. Just Google it. The first trackball. You're trying to get data into your computer. You're trying to make it easier to use. You know, the ability to point to a specific place on the screen rather than just use cursor keys. You know what a trackball is. It's a little ball on a device that you roll around. That's a bowling ball. So the guys who made the first trackball used a bowling ball and had gear wheel here and a geared wheel here, and as the bowling ball moved around, it would send streams of data indicating X, Y position. So that cracks me up, the idea of having that on my, on my desktop. Then maybe the first mouse. As you can kind of tell, the first mouse had two wheels in it. It had one wheel along that side and I had another wheel along another side and in order to move it around you know you hold it like that and then you tilt it a different way and you'd move it like that you know so that was really kind of clumpy but in 1965 that was a bee's knees you know you'd have a handheld device that would move a cursor around on your screen then the idea came you know why doesn't a mouse just become a trackball that you turn upside down you know and with electronics miniaturizing you could do that one more thing, if I can find it. Here we go. Aw. Okay, fine. You can kind of see it there. Doug Engelbart at Stanford led the development of both the first mouse, but he had another input, data input device called the Cord. It was five keys, like organ keys. And if you held, you know, three keys down, it meant one thing. If you held two keys down, it meant something else. If you held down all your pinky, it meant something else. You know, so however many different combinations you can do with five fingers, what are the different kinds of data you can enter with that? And if, who wants to memorize that kind of stuff? You know, only a Stanford professor would want to use something like that. So that didn't take off, but a mouse sure did. All right, that's enough of the Wayback Machine. Let's talk about, oh, memory. We talked about vacuum tubes. If you have a series of light bulbs and they are either on or off, that represents zeros or ones. We're going to be talking about zeros or ones a lot in just a moment. That wasn't the only type of memory that computers had way back when. Or something called mercury memory, which is where you had tubes of mercury with effectively a microphone on one end and a speaker on the other. And if you sent some blips down it to where, you know, a blip meant a one and then a moment of silence meant a zero, then that shock wave, that sound, would travel all the way through the mercury, you know, fairly slowly because mercury is very dense. And then it would be picked up and it would be sent back. And it could be repeat this over and over and over until it needed to be changed. 
So that was a form of random access memory. It's insane to think that, you know, there was a device sitting there with 2,000 tubes of mercury in it, you know, for 2,000 you know, you know, bytes of, of RAM or whatever. But uh, that's, how, that's how some of the machines did it. Another way of doing it was to use a washing machine size. precursor to the disk drive where this thing was rotating constantly and you can see that it's got memory oxide pasted on it and uh, you know so you could read off data and you could write data to it you know and if there was some kind of noise on the, on the tape that you were writing that represented a one and if there was no noise you know at that specific point it meant that it was a zero so your data again was encoded as zeros and ones. So fundamentally, everything on our computer, all our MP3s and videos and our touch screen input and stuff like that, everything we download off the internet, is all ultimately zeros and ones. And are you going to be expected to memorize all of this and know these names, Douglas Engelbart and Mercury Drives? No. But now we're getting into some stuff that I do actually want you to have burned into memory. And I want you to maintain some of this stuff. Oh, we already had that one. Here's a joke. Let's see if it's funny. Never touch the screen while you're compressing a file. All right. Well, that didn't make me laugh, but that's okay. So, at the most basic, the most basic piece of memory that your computer can address would be something that can hold a single zero or one, a transistor or a spot of, of memory on a magnetic disk or whatever that was a zero or a one. That's called a bit. So if you have eight of those in a row, like eight zeros or eight ones or some mixture of the two, that's called a byte. Just kind of remember, that according to computers nowadays, a byte is considered to be 8 bits. The rest of these, I don't care if you think that that's a word, and that's a double, and that's a long double. Well, that actually is useful information. But just remember, the more bits your data stores, the larger the number you can store in it. Why is that? Well, as one bit can only count up to 1. You know, it starts off at 0 and counts off to 1. With 8 bits, you can count up from 0 all the way up to 255. With 16 bits, you can count all the way up from 0 to 65,000, something like that. And then I don't even think that that, date, that number is correct. But you get the idea. Each time you add more bits to it, then the larger the number that can be calculated. And so if you think about your Nintendo from the 80s, it would have an 8-bit graphics card in it, which might be able to display up to 255 colors. And in actuality, it displayed a lot less than that. And so then you got tired of that, and you bought your 16-bit Genesis, which could display one of 65,000 colors on the screen, so the graphics looked a lot better. Or the Super Nintendo, which was the same way. And then you chucked those, and you got your PlayStation, which was a 64-bit device. And it could pick, you know, any of millions of colors for photorealistic, you know, Final Fantasy VII or whatever the first you know, Final Fantasy on the PlayStation was, and so on. So, the larger the bits, the better. We're going to talk about why that is. We're going to learn to count in binary. Now, I've been told in my instructor reviews, you know, when your coworkers and your boss watch you teach, that you're never supposed to stand there with your back to the students because they immediately start surfing Facebook or, you know, playing Candy Crush or whatever. Keep watching me, even when my back's to you. Okay, so if we have the number 234, we instinctively know what that means. We have two 100s and we have three tens and we have four ones. So we'll call this the ones place, the tens place, and the one hundreds place. And then if we had another number, that would be the thousands place, and so on. So if we were going to represent this number, you know, 
we would say that this is 1 times 1,000 plus 2 times 100 plus 3 times 10 plus 4. Now we know math so instinctively that we don't really think of it in these terms. Even less do we think of it in this horrible sense. This is 1 times 10 to the 3 plus 2 times 10 to the 2 plus 3 times 10 to the power of 1 plus 4 times 10 to the power of 0. And it's kind of a quirk of math that anything to the power of 0 is 1. So the 1's column is always to the power of 0 and it's always the 1's place. So, and then we would add these up. What's 1 times 10 to the 3? Well, that's 1,000. What's 2 times 10 to the 2? Well, that's 200. What's 3 times 10 to the 1? Well, that's 30. And 4 times 10 to the 0? That's 4. So we'd add all those up and we'd get 1,234. Now, obviously, we just made a round trip back to our original number. This is a decimal in base 10. Decimal stands for 10, according to some uh, Latin word. And it's kind of funny. You hear the term, you know, we were decimated in battle or whatever, it's just make, making it sound horrible. Well, in Roman times, to decimate the opposing army would be to capture them and to kill one out of every 10 people of the, uh, you know, of the opposing side. Just one, just 10%. But nowadays we use the word decimate to mean like, you know, total root, you know, we killed them all, whatever. Um, so, you know, once you know that, then uh, when you hear people use the word decimate, you know, you kind of think, well, that may be not mean exactly what you think it means, but of course, you know, as everybody thinks a word means something, it actually does start to mean that word. So now it means you know to kill a majority as well as to kill a ten. So base ten, or decimal, when I talk about those numbers, if I want to specify what base it's in, I will put a parenthesis and a ten after it. That means base ten. There are other bases. this class were being held 10 years ago, I would make a joke about all our bases that belong to us, and people would laugh. And that, that little meme is a little too old. Okay, so say, in, you know, decimal, we count, we have 10 digits. And digits on our fingers, yeah. But, you know, our fingers, we start counting with one, and we go up to 10. But really, our digits are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's base 10. Let's make up a base. Let's make up base 3, where the only digits we have are 0, 1, and 2. So we know how to count in base 10. You go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so what's 9 plus 1? Well, how do you increase this 9? You've maxed out your digits. So what happens to the 9? It's like when you're driving in your odometer, you know, you go past the 9, what happens? This one rolls back to the minimum number, and we carry the 1 and add it to the next column. So you keep driving, you know, it becomes 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way to 9. When you want to go more than 19, you want to add 1 to it again, then what does it turn into? We know it turns into 20, but what it's doing is it's rolling this one back to the minimum value and increasing that by 1. And so say you've driven 99 miles and you go over the next mile. What happens? Well, 9 plus 1 exceeds the limit of our numbering scheme in base 10, so that one rolls over to become a 0, and we carry the 1. Well, what happens to that 9? Same thing, it's maxed out. So it rolls to a 0, and we carry the 1 one more time. So 99 turned to 100. And again, instinctively, we know all this. We learned this like in the second grade or whatever. If we had a base 3 system, and some weirdos in the Soviet Union actually built, you know, large computers that were base 3 rather than base 2. They were trinary, and they did research on them, and I have no idea what you could prove with a base 3 computer. But anyways, that, that was like in the 60s and the 70s. Base 3, how would we count? We would start at 0, we would go 1 and 2, now we've maxed out. If we want to add 1 to 2, what happens? Well, what happened when we were at 9? Just, we roll over, so that becomes 10. And then 11, 12, now we've maxed out the ones column again. Roll over again. 2, 1, 2, 2. 
we've maxed out the two. We turn that into a zero. We carry the one. Whoops, we've maxed out that one as well. And what I mean by max out is that we've hit the largest digits that it can support. So that one also becomes a zero. So that's how you count in trinary. Zero, one, two, 10, 11, 12, 20, 21, 22, 100. And then, you know, you keep going on from there. And we're not going to do anything with trinary, but I'm trying to get you used to the idea of, you know, once you've exceeded the number of digits or the maximum value of the digits that you have available to you, you roll it over. I'm going to do one more. We're going to do binary, base two, where you only have two stop, two digits to play with. Now we're going to count in binary. So everything always starts at zero. We add one to zero, we get a one. We add one to that, what happens to it? Well, this rolls over, and we add one to there. Now we add one to that. Okay, now we want to add another one. Well, that was maxed out, the highest digit possible. So we've turned that to a zero, we carry the one. Well, this one's maxed out as well. So we turned it to zero and we carry the one again. And then you continue counting. One, zero, one. One, one, zero. One, one, one. Now all of these are one, so that the next time you have to add one to it, you know zero out those digits and carry it the one all the way to the new place. So that's how you count in binary. So in one of the drop boxes, we're going to count in binary. Sounds gripping, doesn't it? We're going to do four binary digits, I think. We're going to count from 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1. So go ahead and go to the Dropbox and open the Word document. These kind of got messed up to where there were two separate categories for each. So now you can refresh them. It'll look better. We want the one that's stored in in-class assignment B. Binary and decimal. Open that up. Should be a file. Download that file and open it. If it opens it in your browser so that you can't type in it, make sure that you find the download button and download it. So that, that happens for some of the Firefox users. You click on the file and instead of it saving it to disk, it's so that you can open it that way. So make sure you're actually in Word so that you can type. All righty. Scroll down to the page that's called Question 2. I kind of did these out of order. Question 2 is fill in the table and write the binary numbers from 0000 to 1111. I did the first six for us. So what's after 0110? If we added 1 to that, what would it turn into? Yeah. And then you add one to that, and what does it turn into? Yep, exactly. We tack one onto that, and it becomes 10101, like that. So go ahead and fill in the table all the way out to 11111. And that should not be an F at the bottom. I need to delete that. That wasn't too hard. After 1001, we would have made it 1010. Yes, sir. I'm having trouble getting it to download. I'm scrolling down. 
whoa, this is, aha, you got homework one, I wanted in class B. Sorry about that, I did not make that clear enough. So uh, go back into the Dropbox. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. All right, so various people start reading out. What's next? What's after 1010? 1011. Yep. Somebody in the second row. What's one zero? What's one past that? 1100. Somebody from the third row. Yep. Somebody from the fourth row. You two ladies. If you don't know, that's okay, but uh, it means that I'll have to go through it again. So what's after 1100 when, excuse me, 1101, when we want to add one to that number, what does it turn into? Okay. Yeah, you got them all right. Y'all knew it, you just weren't speaking up. Don't be shy. And then lastly, one more than 1101. There's only one person in the fifth row. Can you tell me? Yep, exactly. Cool. And then the decimal value of it. Well, we could just keep counting all the way down. But now I want to talk about how to convert a binary number to decimal. You know, because it's real easy when they're all lined up like this. I just put a 7 there and an 8 there and a 9 there, you know, like this. That's a 7, obviously. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. But if, you, if I give you the number 1011 and ask you what its decimal value is and you didn't have this memorized, and why would you? You can calculate it pretty easily. So remember, we were talking about our tens place, and our ones place, and our hundreds place, and our thousands place. Binary works the same way. So you have 2 to the power of 0, which is 1. Any number to the power of 0 is 1, with the possible exception of 0 to the power of 0. That's probably 0. 2 to the power of 1. That just means two, it's 2 all by itself. It's not multiplied against anything. So that's 2. This is 2 to the power of 2. That means 2 squared. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 to the power of 3. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So instead of being ones place, tens place, hundreds place, and a thousands place, we have the ones place, the twos place, the four place, and the eighth place. And so this is just doubling each time. So if we tacked on another one, what would it be? It'd be 16. The next one would be 32. The next one would be 64, and so on. So if we have this number, 0, 1, 1, 0, that means that we have 0 times 8 plus 1 times 4 plus 1 times 2, plus 0 times 1. And so out of these, you know, zeros don't matter. I cross them out, and we get 1 plus 4, which is 4, plus 2 is equal to 6. So that means that 0, 1, 1, 0 is 6. Does that make sense? Let's throw in another number up there. Well, 
just memorize that it starts at 1 and it keeps doubling. 16, 32, 64. Now, really, I'm not going to ask you to do more than 4 or 5 wise. I don't want to add up numbers, you know, that are larger than 64 or whatever in my head. I'm not going to ask you all to do it either. So let's say that instead of 1, 1, that we had 1, 0, 1, 0. So if we were going to add this up, this would be 1 times what? 8 plus 0 times 4. I'm just going to skip writing that. Plus 1 times 2 plus, what's the last thing? 0 times 1, which is just 0. So it's 8 plus 2 is 10. So that means that 1, 0, 1, 0 is equal to 10. We could confirm that by scrolling back down to our little chart down here. Yeah, 1, 0, 1, 0 did equal 10. So the first set of problems. Scroll back up. Here we go. Fill in the table and convert these binary numbers to base 10. Don't do that by scrolling down and looking up what 0, 1, 1, 1 is. Add them up. So if this is the 1's place and the 2's place and the 4's place, this is equal to... 4 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 7. So I'll give you all a second to fill in the last three. I really don't want you to do them in your head. Go ahead and write out the 4 plus the 2 plus the 1 or whatever it is. So what's this? What two numbers am I adding together in this row? Four and one. Yeah, that's a 4 and a 1. That's a 5. What about this one? No. Nope. 4 and 2. 4 and 2. And if that's what you said, I thought I heard you say 1 and 2. And then lastly, what's this one? Eight. Right, 8 and 4. And so if you had a really long sequence of numbers, like this, and you don't have to type this in, you know, this is just kind of a whoopsie. And you wanted to calculate it. And that's the ones place, this is the twos, this is the fours, this is the eight. So what would that make that one? 16, 32, whoops, where'd that come from? 64 and 128. So what's the largest value that eight bits can hold? Well, let's set them all equal to one. Yeah, it's 255. We would add up, you know, 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. And that's equal in value. Why is it not 256? Is that not what it adds up to? It actually is not because notice that it's adding 1 to it. You know it's an odd number. Mm -hmm. Your instinct is right, though. There are 256 different values, but that's because 0 also counts as value. So we have 0 through 255. So our range of values is all zeros, which is equal to 0, and all 1s, which is equal to 255. And so that equals 256 total values. Just like from 0 to 9 is 10 digits, 
same same idea. And if you care, I think the formula for this would be two to the power of x or eight, yeah, in this case, minus one is equal to the largest value. So if you have two bits, it's two to the power of two, which is four minus one. So two bits can count up to a maximum value of three, zero, one, two, three. If you have four bits, that's four to the two to the power of four, whatever. Two to the power of four is sixteen. So four bits could add up to sixteen minus one is equal to fifteen. Zero through fifteen. So four bits will get you up to sixteen. And we could already see that. You know, because eight plus four plus two plus one is fifteen. If we had six bits available to us, it'd be all those numbers added up together. Right offhand, I don't. That'd be uh, 63. If we had seven bits available to us, we'd have 127 different values. And that's a number we'll see again later in another uh, day when I mention the ASCII chart. The ASCII chart is based on a seven-bit character set. So it has from value zero to 127. And that seems kind of arbitrary, but 127 is what you could store with seven bits of data. Now, computers do not always use eight bits as in a byte. You know, earlier computers may have used four or six. In this particular case, they were using seven characters to store the digit. And what, the, what was the eighth bit used for? I don't know. There, uh, maybe as a parity bit. There's something called a parity bit, which you use to check to make sure that the rest of the bits are correct. And if there's an even number of bits, the parity bit is set to zero. And if there's an odd number of bits following it, then the parity bit is set to one. So maybe that's what they use the eighth bit for when they were uh, creating the ASCII table. I don't know. Okay, so that is enough of this one. Let's go ahead and upload that. Do a save and upload it into Dropbox B. And again, the uh, in-class ones are the ones that are named with letters. I'm, I'm going to know it's your work, but you may as well stick your name up at the top of it or do a save as and put your name on it. Either would be totally cool. I, I didn't specify that, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to go into Dropbox for B. Add a file. Go find my file. Upload it. Click Add and then click Submit. And I'll know I got it up there when it actually says File Upload Results Submission Successful. All righty, gang. We've been here an hour at least. So why don't we take a five minute break if you want to run down to the Coke machine or use a bathroom or play five minutes of Angry Birds or whatever. And uh, I'll see y'all back here in five minutes. Let's say 820, at least by this clock. Is everybody getting these stuff uploaded correctly? I didn't want to.
Alrighty guys, so we know that in decimal we have 10 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And in binary we have two digits, 0 and 1. And trinary, if we cared, would be 0, 1, and 2. Yeah, okay, delete that. But there is, you know, when you're converting these series of zeros and ones to numbers, it's not really a very good conversion because, you know, you have 0, 0, 0, 1, which could be a 0, and then you have, you know, 1, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0, 1, 0, which is a 10. So if you were trying to convert, you know, series of numbers, You have to use, you know, two digits to represent each one. That'd be a 0, 1. This would be a 10. This would be a 12. Let's say 4 plus, no, I'm doing that one wrong. 4 plus 2 is a 6. This one would be an 8 plus a 4, which is a 12. And then this one would be all of them, which is 15. Okay, so, yeah, you could represent them like that, but if you had a way, a higher counting system than just decimal, then you could make it so that you could just use one digit per cluster of four, rather than two digits per cluster of four. And that is called binary, excuse me, hexadecimal. We know that decimal means ten, hex, like hexagonal, means six, six. so you have six plus ten is sixteen, you have sixteen digits. So this is base 16. Binary is base 2. Decimal is base 10. The first 10 digits of hexadecimal are the same as in decimal. You know, why reinvent the wheel? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. But that's only 10. We want to go up until we've counted 16 numbers. Why 16? Because 4 bits have 16 different possibilities from 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1. So what are we going to call the next one? Well, if we can make one like a triangle and the next one an upside down triangle and the third one, you know, a sideways triangle pointing to the left and, you know, whatever. We could make up symbols kind of like what the Greeks did whenever they needed new numbers. Even they, even they reuse symbols, you know, in order to make their numbers, they just used V's and I's and X's and M's and C's. We're going to reuse two. A, B, C, D, E, and F. We stop at F because that's actually 16 of them right there. We counted them off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Just trust me, that's 16 of them. So if we're going to count to hexadecimal, in, in hexadecimal, we have 16 different digits to play with rather than just 10. So if we're going to count in hex, we have, let's, uh, let's do like just two digits. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, 5, 0, 6, 0, 7, 0, 8, 0, 9. What comes next? Not 10, because we're only here. We haven't maxed out the capacity of that column yet. So next is 0A, 0B, 0C, 0D, 0E, 0F. Now we have maxed out the capacity of that counter. Now we roll it over. That one turns into a zero, and then we carry the one and stick it into the next column. And so on. You know, you could count one, 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 two, all the way up to one, nine. What's, what's after one, nine? You add one to one, nine, you get one A. one A. And then you keep going all the way up to one F. One more than one F? Yep, two, zero, because the F turns into a zero, and we carry the one over to, like that all the way up to FF, and then if you wanted to add one more to FF, it becomes like that. Because the F turns into a zero, you carry the one over, that F turns into a zero, you carry the one over and you get that. So, this gives you 200, this is, FF is equal to 255 in decimal if you want to convert it, and we can prove that. We'll, we'll prove that in just a minute. And so, 0 to 255, 256 different values can be represented by two hexadecimal values.
So if we wanted to convert these numbers here, did I erase them or did I put them down here? Yeah. Let's just make up an itty bitty little table that, you know, just does the single digits and then their decimal and their binary equivalents. I should actually put this in a Word document so I can make tables, but I didn't, so we'll live with it. Okay. So if we were going to count in binary, I have to do this in a table, I'm sorry. You don't have to add this to yours, but we have zero, then we have zero and zero in all three formats. And this is going to be the hex value of it, this is going to be the binary value of it, and this is going to be the decimal value of it. Let's turn that into a table and we will work on it. Okay, so what's the next hex value? One. The next binary value is one. The next decimal value is one. We add one to that, we get two. We add one to that, and what does binary get when you increase one by one? Somebody knows. We were just doing this earlier. What zero one turn into when we add one to it? Yeah, one zero. And then two. And we're actually going to need four bits, so I'm going to just tack on four bits like this. Okay. Then we have, and I think I'm not going to complete this table because I think I have it completed in the homework one box. So anyways, that is going to be what? We've added one to it. Zero, zero, one, one. Yeah, thank you. And then four is what? Yeah, zero, one, zero, zero. And so there's a joke. There's only two people, kinds of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. Now I expect a huge amount of laughter because now we know that I'm, I botched the joke, dadgummit. It's ten kinds of people in the world, those who understand binary and those who don't. Eh, I totally botched that. I call class off. I'm ashamed. No, okay. Anyways, so, and then we go on. We keep going like the on until we get to, uh, you know, the really interesting ones, you know, uh, A, B, and C, and D, and E, and F, and A happens to be a decimal that, and it happens to be, you know, that, and a B, one more than that is that, and a C, one more than that, that, a D, one more than that is that, an E, one more than that is that, and an F maxed out, one, 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 one is 15. So with this chart in mind, if I had done the rest of them, let me just open up that homework one assignment because I think that that chart is in there. Go ahead and go to the Dropbox and find Homework Assignment 1. It's another Word document. Open it up. We'll do it in class rather than send it to you for home. So if we scroll down, we have this little chart here, which is just what I was creating. You have your hex values, which are the ones in blue, 0, 1 through 9, followed by A to F, and then you have their decimal equivalents, and you have their binary equivalents. Now, anytime I ask you to convert from hexadecimal to binary or vice versa, I'll give you this chart to make it really easy. 
So how does that work? Well, let's knock this guy over here, shrink him down so we can see them all. Let's go back to that notepad where I had a string of numbers and I wanted to convert them. Well, this isn't going to work. Maybe if I... So, even without these numbers, if I deleted this column, what is a 0, 0, 1 in hex? Just look it up. 0, 0, 0, 1 is in hex what? It's a 1. And what is a 1, 0, 1, 0? That's an 8 plus a 4 plus a 2 is an 8. Yep. Whoopsie. And what is a 0, 1, 1, 0? Yep. That's a 6. What's this next one? 1, 1, 0, 0. And lastly, what's all 1s? Yeah. Okay. So without doing the math, as long as we had that lookup table, that was really easy to convert. Let's do it the other way. Let's convert BAD, BEAD, and let's make it only four long. Bad one, bad five. So if this is base 16, we want to convert it to, to binary, base two. So what is a B? In binary. Yeah, it's one zero one one. And then what's the A? Yeah, it's one zero one zero. And what's the D? One one oh one. And what's the five? Yep, zero one zero one. And you could, you know, remove the spaces from it, but I like leaving the spaces in just, you know, to make it easy for us to visually parse. So if we want to convert from hexadecimal to binary or vice versa, and if we have this chart, it's really easy. And anytime I ask you to do this, I will give you a chart. Like, you know, if I give you a quiz or I put it on the exam or whatever, I'll give you that chart. So let's look at the rest of this document besides the chart. Okay, so in this one, the notes, the explanation are all on page one through five, and the homework is on the last page. We've already seen this. This is going to look real familiar. The ones place, the twos place, the fours place, the eight, the ones, the tens, the one hundreds and thousands. How to count in binary. Zero, one, ten, eleven, one hundred, one hundred and one, 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 zero, one, one, one. And we can do that all the way out to as many digits as we ask for. So converting from binary to two decimal, if we have binary 1010 zero, zero, and we wanted to add them up that would be an 8 no fours plus a 1 and no zeros I'm flying through this pretty fast because this is what we just did a minute ago whereas 1111 you're adding an 8 a 4 a 2 and a 1 together which adds up to 15 and base 10 hexadecimal in hexadecimal, we have our digits 0 through 9, but in order to give ourselves 6 more, we use the letters A through F, which represents numbers greater than 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So this block are the extra digits given to us. So if you have a hexadecimal number, it's in powers of 16. You have a 1's column, but then instead of a 10's column, you have a 16's column. And then instead of a hundreds column, you have a 256. And you have a 4,096. Do I expect you to memorize that? No, I'm not going to ask you to convert from hex to binary. Excuse me, from hex to decimal. Because it requires a lot of addition, and you know I really don't want you to, to figure out 2 times 4,096 plus 11 times 256. You know, those numbers are huge. 
So converting a hexadecimal number to decimal. Zero, zero, AF. Well, what's an A? It's a 10. So that means 10 times 16. And what's an F? It's a 15. So that means 15 times 1. So 10 times 16 is 160. F is 15 times 1, and that's 15. So 160 plus 15 is 175. Same idea here. We have 1 times 4,096 plus 0 times 256 plus 2 times 16 plus 8 plus 1 is equal to that. So we've converted that hexadecimal number to that binary number. There's our chart. Converting from base 2 to base 16 using that lookup chart. Converting from base 16 to base 2 using that lookup chart. Now here's our homework. Now here's the same thing we were doing a minute ago, so we're going to really fly through this, aren't we? What is 0011 in decimal? Without using the lookup chart, we know that that is equal to 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. Just do the next two. And of course, you could also hit the lookup table that we had up there for doing this, but it's good to know how to do it. Okay, the next one. Using that chart. Let me make a copy of that chart. Slam that in a window over here. Let's convert 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 1 to hexadecimal. So what is that first one, 0, 0, 1, 1, hitting the lookup? Yep, that's a 3. What is this one? 9. What about 1, 1, 1, 0? Oh? That's an E, and that's a 1. You know, some of them you can I, you, you know just by looking at them, but you know when they get to be larger than nine, it's nice to have the chart to hit. How about this one? What is a one zero one one? Yeah. How about that one? How about that one? And lastly, two. Yep. Is this making sense to everybody? I'm not wandering around to make sure that everybody's writing this down before. You know I do. I should probably give y'all a worksheet to work on at home, but I didn't write one up, so y'all are going to get off scot-free for homework for today. All right, how about this last one? We have these two hexadecimal numbers that we want to convert from hexadecimal back to binary. What is an A in binary? One zero one zero. Yeah, it's 1010, zero one zero, so a B is one more than that. And for some reason I repeated the A, don't know why, and then D. Somebody tell me what D is. Yeah, 1101. Okay. And do the same thing for the next one. All right. When you're done with that, do a save as and put your name in the file name or put your name up at the top of the document and upload it into the homework Dropbox. I need to get something on our own rather than just copying it. All right. I was about to do something dramatically important. What was it? Get the PowerPoints. That's right.
All right, so there we have the first four chapters of the book in PowerPoint form. And thank you for reminding me to take a roll. So now we're done with the background history and binary and stuff like that. Let's actually go to the contents and look at the PowerPoint for Chapter 1. If I correctly recall, we're not going to spend a lot of time in it, but I could be wrong. Let me go look. Introduction to Computers and Programming. Why program? Yeah, whatever. Hardware and software. What is software? Software is the program. Why is it called software? Because it's not silicon, you know. You write your software and you store it on memory. And it's easy to erase it and replace it. And it's called software. The hardware is the silicon chips that run your computer. And input devices are things like keyboards and mice. Or that cord thing if you were the you know, Stanford professor. Trackballs. Whatever. Output devices are things that display, like printers, screens, speakers. Nowadays, things are more complicated, you know. Keyboards are both input devices and output devices. You may have one of those gamer keyboards, you know, that has a little display here, you know, and it gets information from the game you're playing and displays it or whatever. You know, everything, this data comes both ways, but, you know. You have to be able to tell that the printer is out of paper, so the printer is also an input device because it's sending information back about how many pages are, are left in it or the state of the car uh, ink cartridges or whatever. But we, we have that general idea. Main memory. Main memory. Memory is the uh, stuff inside of the computer that contains those zeros and ones. It's called volatile, meaning not that it's likely to explode if it gets angry but that it gets erased when it's turned off. So that is why your computer has to reboot every time, you know, you lose power on it. If you don't have some kind of, you know, un 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 uninterruptible power supply on it. It's also known as random access memory. What does random access mean? Well, like if you had a paper tape and uh, your paper tape or your stack of cards was controlling the computer, that's not random access. It had to go through it um, sequentially, linearly, one after the other after the other. And, so if you wanted to get byte number 1,000, you had to read the first 9,999 first. But now, you know, memory, electronic memory is clever enough that if you ask, you know, for byte number 1,000, it just, the hardware magically brings you that byte. So a bit is the smallest piece of memory. It has values of 0 or 1, false or true. And the byte is the smallest addressable piece of memory in your computer, either on the hard drive. Well, not all devices have hard drives anymore, right? My iPad doesn't have a hard drive. Your watch doesn't, but, you know, or or in solid state memory, you know, flash drive or whatever, like used in our phones. Each byte is sequentially addressed. The first byte is byte zero. The second byte is byte one. The third byte is byte two. Nowadays, computers, you know, ship with eight gigabytes of RAM, eight billion bytes of RAM or whatever. So, you know, the last bit would be eight number, bit number, byte number eight billion. Not exactly, though. So each number is identified by a unique number known as its address, each byte in memory. Each byte could contain one hexades uh, two hexadecimal numbers because it's eight bits. So in figure 1-4, the number 149 is stored in byte 16. Notice that they start accounting as 0. The number 70, 72 is stored at address 23. Secondary storage. Secondary storage is the non-volatile storage, meaning that it preserves its data even when it's turned off. If you reset your Android phone, you know, um, all your data is still on it. That's because it was all written to, you know, static memory, to, uh, to the flash memory that's stored in the device. Or probably even stored in the cloud. You know, they talk about the cloud now, you know, so that you don't have to keep all the data on your device. 
So non-volatile is important because it'd be a real drag if every time you turned your computer off, you lost all the data you had entered. Imagine taking the census for all 400 million households in the United States. You had all that data stored in a computer, and then you turned the computer off, and you lost all 400 million pieces of data that you had stored in it. That'd be a drag. You'd want to store it in a non-volatile format, not volatile, mean, volatile meaning that it, it erases itself when it turns off. There's all sorts of non-volatile memory. Lots of these we don't use anymore. We don't use floppy disks. We don't use magnetic tape. Lots of laptops don't even come with hard drives anymore. They come with static, you know, um, SSD drives. A lot of laptops also don't come with CD-ROMs or DVD drives. And flash drives. And we all still use flash drives. You, know, you plug into the USB port. We know what an input device is. It's something that gathers input from the user and sends it to the computer. There are other kinds of input devices too, of course. The screen, the touch screen on our pads and phones are input devices. And when you're pressing it, it tells it how hard you're pressing it, the XY coordinate of what you're pressing, how long your finger has been there, and so as you drag your finger across, that is, you know, those numbers are translated into something that the program understands as being a swipe or a drag or whatever. Categories of software. System software is the stuff that manages the computer hardware. You know. This machine is a Windows machine, so it has a Windows operating system on it. And it's got applications that manage, you know, how it works. There's software in it that manages the memory. There's software in it that controls, you know, access to the hard drive. All the software that displays these windows, you know, and, uh, you know, draws the things on the screen controls your video card is all system software. Also, you know, things like um, the utilities that you use to add a new device. You're going to add a new, you know, keyboard, a new printer or whatever. That's system software. Or, uh, you know, you're going to reformat your hard drive. That's system software. So operating systems and utility programs and software development tools is all considered system software because you're using it to control the computer. It's all oriented at controlling the computer. Application software is software that's not just useful to the computer, but it's useful to us as well. So that you can do word processing, or spreadsheets, or, you know, games, or print payroll, or, you know, do homework, that kind of stuff. So that's generally the difference between system software and application software. And what we focus on in our class is application software. We're not writing stuff that, you know, reformats the drive, or, you know, controls the video. Instead, we're, you know, getting data from the user. We're processing the data so that we can display some results back to the user. Programs and programming languages. What is a program? It's a recipe. What is a recipe? You know, take two eggs and two pounds of flour and throw them in the oven, bake for seven hours, and then call the fire department. There. That's my recipe. It's a very bad recipe. Um, but it's a series of instructions for accomplishing a task. That is what a program is. It's a set of instructions that the computer follows to perform a task. And we start with the idea of an algorithm, which is a set of well-defined steps. Like if you wanted to add up all the numbers between 1 and 100, you can write an algorithm that does that. You know, take the number 1, add it into a a accumulator and then increment that number one to change it to a two and then add that into the accumulator so you have one plus two and then take that number again and add it and so now you have one plus two plus three as your accumulator and we may as well do that just because this is kind of of a boring lecture let's uh i mean the rest of it's been thrilling but this part <laughs> maybe not so much Go ahead and pop open Visual Studio. And do new project. Choose Visual C++ and then choose empty project. And let's give it a better name than that. So give it my initials and call it, I don't know, 
in class C. That creates an empty project to which we will add a C++ file in a moment. So to add a C++ file, I go to the Source Files folder in my Solution Explorer. If you can't find your Solution Explorer, you probably can find it. Oh gosh, I don't know where it's hidden. But you can always reset your window layout to get it to pop back up over there. It's under view. Okay, yeah. So if it got closed for some reason, go back to prod, uh, view and find wherever it is. Yeah, right up at the top. Not alphabetical, but at least it's up at the top. Okay, right click on source files, do add new item. I don't care about the name, I'm just going to leave mine source.cpp, or I could put my initials in front of it. So I'm going to put a comment up at the top of this file. My name, the date, June 8. And this is going to be a program for doing summation, which is adding a series of numbers. So before I actually write the program, I'm going to describe the algorithm in English. And this is what's known as pseudocoding. Pseudocoding is when you write a description of the problem in something that kind of describes what the program is doing, but it's not actually in the syntax. And why would you do that? Well, not every program's in C++. You know, some people program in Java or Python or this or that. You can give a programmer pseudocode and then they can turn it into the language of their choice. So, I'm going to do this. Set total equal to zero. Now, that's not a program line. That's just English line. That I have a variable called total, and I want to copy the value zero into it. And then set start equal to one, because that's going to be our starting point. Set our stopping point equal to 100. We're going to add up all the numbers between 1 and 100. And then set our counter equal to our start. And so again, we're, caught, we're, we're doing stuff that we haven't even learned anything about, but that's just so that when we actually hit it, it's already familiar to it. We're going to write a while loop that says while the counter is less than or equal to the stop, and I'm going to use these curly braces. Total is equal to total plus counter, and then increase the counter by one, counter plus plus. The plus plus means add one to the counter and store it back into the counter. And then when we're done, we're going to print the total. That's our pseudocode. I could give you this pseudocode, and once you're familiar with the language, you could turn this into a C++ program really easily. Now, my t text is too big to keep all of this on the screen where I'm actually putting my program. Now, I need that boilerplate code that I used earlier, that I used last program. So I saved it as a text file. I saved a file called boilerplate text. But if you didn't, you're going to need to type this in again. So underneath all of that, su that pseudocode, here's what I need. I need the first line to say include angle brace IO stream. IO stream is a library for doing in, um, input and output, input from the keyboard and output to the screen. stay there unless the machine crashes and it gets replaced. 
Some of the computers, the ones in the lab, I think they completely erase themselves between, you know, each time you log off. But the, the ones in the classrooms don't erase themselves. You can't guarantee I, I being here, but it's very likely to be here. I should make the boilerplate code just an upload in the content. I'll do that. We don't need any of this. We don't need that right now. So delete that. We do want the rest because this is where our actual code is going to go. We put the pseudocode up here, but our real code is going to go here. So after you get your boilerplate all typed in, you can run it just to make sure that it does something. So choose debug, start without debugging. Now it's not going to do anything. Except display a window that says press any key to continue. But that's okay. That's all the boilerplate code is supposed to do. But now our real code goes into it. So what was the first line of our pseudocode? I need you to tell me because I, I don't have it in front of me. Okay, so we're going to use integers. An integer is a number that doesn't have a fractional component. It's a whole number. Like 1 is an integer. 2 is an integer. 3 is an integer. 3.5 is not an integer because it's got that, point, that uh, point 0.5. So int, standing for integer, total is equal to 0. And then if I recall correctly, we had a start and a stop, right? So int start, we're going to start adding at 1. Int stop, our stopping value is 100. And then we have a counter, and our counter starts at our starting position. We could shorten this. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to even go there. Pardon me? No, no, we don't need that. INT is, a, uh, is built into the C language. The things that are blue here are built into the language and they don't need to be imported. C out and CIN are not built into the language, so they won't show up as blue when we type them in. Okay, so now we're going to use our while loop. So while our counter is less than or equal to the stopping point, and when you do a while loop, you have to put the condition inside parentheses. That's different than in some languages where you can leave the parentheses off. And then we need some more of those curly braces. And what that means is that as long as this is condition is true, keep repeating this code over and over and over and over. So what's the next line of, of our pseudocode? Inside the while loop, what do we do? Yeah, total is equal to total plus counter. We're adding the value of the counter, and then we're adding one to the value of the counter. And then lastly, we're going to print the total out. So C out, total is, I'm going to break this on several lines. That's E-N-D-L. It's not E-N-D-1, it's E-N-D-L. I'm breaking it up on three lines just so that you don't can't possibly make any typos. But really, all of this, all three of these things should be on one line. So, you know, just put it all on one line if you want. Because that's how it's going to be printed out. Now I'm going to run it and see if it actually does what I'm expecting it to do. Yep, that's correct. I just, not that I magically know that, but I've written this program often enough to, to recognize that. There's a formula that you can use to calculate that in one fell swoop rather than uh, repeating it. So, we heard the term algorithm. 
This is the algorithm. The pseudocode is the algorithm. This is the algorithm for adding up all the numbers between 1 and 100. This is the program. The program is known as source code. The source code is the implementation of that algorithm in the specific language. You can also implement programming in any of the other programming languages that exist in the world. Okay, so just as a little bit of a thought puzzle, I want you to modify this program after you get it working. And I'm going to wander around to make sure that everybody gets it working. Modify it so it does multiplication rather than addition. And make sure that the total is not zero when it's done. If you run it and it says zero, then the implementation of it is not complete. So work on doing that yourself. We'll do, we'll do it together at the end. So, you know, if you don't get it done, that's fine. But uh, see if you can get that to work. If you need a printout of this because I was typing too fast, that's totally fine. Anybody want a printout? One, I'll print two copies of it out. I put this in what's known as a multi-line comment. Slash slash is a single line comment, which means that it, that line is green, but it doesn't affect what comes after it. A multi-line comment begins with a slash and a star, and it ends in a star and a slash. So if all of your text is green, it's because you didn't catch me typing in the asterisk followed by the slash. Set your stop to 10 rather than 100. I forgot to check. You're going to need your closing comment marker. Go ahead and run it and see if it works. Just keep on running that. Start. my warning about the zero. Why does it end up being zero after you make the change to multiply rather than add? If it crashes when it runs, it's because 100 is too high of a stopping value. Change it to 10. Go to stop and make the stopping value 10. And it changes to say total is equal to total times counter, and it won't crash. If it's set to 100, I apologize, I chose too large of a value. I believe it crashes. No, it doesn't. But either way, if it. So if you're scratching for some reason. Why is it coming out zero? Because what is the first number it multiplies by? The total is zero. So zero is, e you know, is equal to zero times. It keeps multiplying it by zero the whole time. It starts off with a zero. And so starting off at zero is great when you're adding one and two and three and four. But zero times anything is zero. So we can't start our total counter at zero. What's it need to be? One. One. You got it. Once you do that, it'll actually be able to run. Yeah, 
I think that's because I've said it to him. So change it to be start is 1 and stop is 10. You want to start your total at 1 rather than 0 for the reason I just explained because 0 times anything is 0. So you keep multiplying it, but its original number was 0. If you change it to 1 and 10, then when you run it, you will get what you just said. Yeah, 30, 300, 3 million, 60, you know, whatever that number is. Okay. Yes, if it says it cannot open it, if you get the error cannot open, what that means is that there's a copy of the program already running. So like if I do this and I leave this open, that is that one right there. Now say I make a change to it, whatever my change is going to be, I'm just going to add a little comment there, it doesn't do anything. But, but when I build it again, it can't write that file because it's already running. So you have to close the last running copy of it before you can rebuild it.
change to it. Let's figure out why 100 was too large of a number. I can, but I also hope that you understand that I'm throwing you in the water without even explaining some of this junk. Okay. Um, so it's not like you're supposed to know what this stuff does or okay. even understand it at this point. It's kind of like I'm teaching you to swing the, the racket without you know knowing how to play tennis yet. So what this line does is it brings in a library that lets us do C out and C I in. C out sends data to the screen, CIN reads from the screen. Now this program doesn't read from the screen, I mean from the keyboard. The next line tells it that we don't want to have to preface everything that's in this library with the letters STD. If we commented that out, then we'd get some errors that we would have to fix by coming and putting STD colon colon in front of all this stuff. And that gets real tedious if you have a whole bunch of lines, you know, that are giving you errors because you didn't have that. So I'm going to undo that change. This next line says that this program has a function in it called main. Every program we write will have a main function because that's how the operating system knows where to start executing. You can write a program that has a thousand different functions in it, but in if none of them are named main, the program won't run. And so there should be one and only one main function in your program. And so then what these are, are these are known as variables. Variables are named places of memory. It's, a, it's an address in memory. We don't assign it which address. We don't say, oh, by the way, this is at memory address 26 and this is at memory address 100. The programming language does that for us. But we say that that memory has a name of total. And it's called a variable because it can change. You know, this counter keeps changing. This total keeps changing. It varies. So that's what it, why it's called a variable. We're saying, okay, we have one place in memory which is going to hold the number one. And we have another place in memory named start, which also holds the number one. And we have a stopping, a, another variable called stop, which holds the ten. And lastly, we have one more variable, which is a counter. And this one's going to change each time we go through the loop. Now, this is what's known as a while loop. A while loop is some computer code that keeps repeating until this condition is no longer true. When we start off, counter is equal to 1, and stop is equal to 10. So is 1 less than 10? It sure is. So it will execute this line, these two lines of code. And then we add one to the counter. We come back up here. Counter is now equal to 2. Is 2 less than or equal to 10? It sure is. And it goes 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 is less than or equal to 10. It repeats one more time. And then counter is added 1 to it again. So counter is now equal to 11. It comes back to it, is 11 less than 10? Nope. So the while loop stops. And so then it displays to the screen using a, a command called C out, which stands for console out. Other languages have a print statement, which do the same thing, but C++ has a, the word called C out. And this says, show the word total, followed by the value of the total variable, followed by ENDL, which means an end of line, so just like hitting you know, the re enter key on a, on a keyboard. And then this calls the operating system underneath to display that hit any key to continue message. Because if we didn't have that, then when we ran it, it would run so fast and close the window that we wouldn't even see the results. Boom. You know, Great. I want to see my results, though, so I have to have that in there. And then the return statement means, okay, I'm done with my main function. I want to bail out. So once you return from your main function, the program will stop executing. And why is there a number there? Just kind of take that on faith for now. So hope that kind of makes sense. Yeah. I want to make a change here that shows the value of the counter and the total. It prints it out. So between total is equal to total times counter, I'm going to add a C out statement. C out, let me zoom in. There's no reason to make it so small. 
the counter, followed by a space, followed by the total, followed by the ENDL. And again, that could all be done on one line. I'm only doing it on, on separate lines to make it extraordinarily simple to type without errors. And what do I mean on one line? I would just do this if I wanted to put it on one line. And you don't even need those spaces. You know, If we wanted to make it look as compact as possible, I could delete all the spaces from it. But you know, that's really hard to read. <laughs> so I don't do it that way. Instead, I put everything on their, on their own line. and add white space to try to make it easy to read. Okay, now that I've made that change, if I made it correctly when I run it, I will see the value of the total and the counter as it goes. The counter goes from one to 10, and here's that sum. Actually, I guess at this point it's a product. When you multiply, it's called a product. Change the stopping point from 10 to 20 and run it and see how large that number gets. 31 is the highest you can go. You've already made this change, huh? Yeah. Okay. So 20, notice it rolled around. I, I think I predicted earlier that if you had overflow, if your number wrapped around after a certain point, it would become negative. Well, there we see it. So stopping point of 30. It wrapped around so large that it became positive again, and then negative again, and then positive again. Okay, you know. So obviously, the last value that will actually work before it flips and starts becoming negative is 16. And so that is because this is probably a 16-bit, no, a 32-bit number. There are other data types in C++ that can hold larger than more bits. There's a type called long, long int. That sounds absurd, I'm sorry. But a long, long int has 64 bits rather than 32, and it can hold much larger values. So if we change our total from being an int to a long, long int, then we should be able to add more than 16 numbers before it starts going berserk. There we go. We got it to successfully work at least all the way to 20 before the uh, overflow data corrupted, you know, and, and flipped it. So products become too large for the computer to handle very, very quickly. Whereas summation, you know, you can add, a, add numbers very quickly. I mean, uh, you can add huge amounts of numbers without it causing any overflow. Multiplication is the problem. That is about enough. So for the benefit of the people watching at home, for the benefit of those watching at home, let's scroll through the program one more time so everybody gets a good chance to look at it. There's our comment block. Every one of the programs we write needs a comment block. There's our pseudocode. I'm going to add a word pseudocode up here just to explain, explain what that is. This is the algorithm. Of course, the algorithm has changed since we, we changed it down here. It's out of date. Sorry. That's because we made changes to the code. And that's one of the problems in programming is that you go and you keep improving the, uh, the program and you don't go back and, and make notes of the changes. And here's the actual code of the program. Right from there to all the way to the bottom. If you refresh your Dropbox, you'll see that there's a Dropbox for in-class assignment C. Just go into it, add your file to it. I'm going to zip up the entire project, but I'm just as happy just getting the CPP file only out of it. So I'm going to go into summation. I'm going to click add a file. And I know all of y'all know I already how to do this, but I'm doing it also for the 
for future generations to look at this video. Actually, I think everybody's here except for the one person who apparently dropped the class. So I shouldn't necessarily be doing this. I'm going to go into Documents, Visual Studio 2013, Projects, and there's my In Class C project. I can right click on that and do Send to Compressed Folder. That will make a zip file. And then I can double click on that zip file to upload it. If I wasn't going to do it that way, if I was only only going to send the source code file, I would click upload, I would go into the folder that has that name, and then I have to go into that folder again that has the same name. I'm sorry, that's kind of weird. And then I would find the .cpp file, or where it says C++ source. That's my file. I double click on that, and I add, and I submit it. And I double check, I come over here, summation, I see a submission here. Good deal. All right. And so when you come back in on Monday, everything will have a great.